All right, folks, today I'm going to tell you a little bit about Love Canal, the worst love story ever that took place uh, just outside of Niagara Falls in New York. So I'm not very close from or not very far from Rochester. Um, so I'm going to I know you watched the video of Lois Gibbs, the one of the mothers who lived in Love Canal um, in that area. I'm just going to give you a, a brief overview of how all of this happened. Now, just to clarify, I'm never going to test you on this stuff, but it really does help to kind of put it in context when you see what happened one event after another. So Love Canal was an idea that was created by a guy named William T. Love in 1892. He wanted to dig a canal about six miles long to connect the upper and the lower Niagara River to create a fake waterfall to generate hydropower. And it was very philanthropic. It was a great philanthropic idea. He wanted to use this hydropower to then create low income housing where people could have access to really inexpensive water and be really close to a reasonably major city. Um, but it never really worked out for him. And he ended up selling the property in 1920. Um, and so he sold it to Hooker Chemical Corporation, which was part of Occidental Petroleum. It was used in part in this area to dump a whole bunch of waste. Um, it wasn't just used by Hooker Chemical, though. It was also used by the city of Niagara and by the U.S. Army. And by 1953, Hooker filled in the canal, buried all of the waste, um, and sold it went to the Board of Education in Niagara Falls for a dollar. Um, and Niagara Falls at this point was experiencing this big population boom and they didn't have places for their kids to go to school. At the time, Hooker did disclose that there were chemical waste buried on the property, but the city of Niagara thought it was safe enough that they bought it and in 1954, the following year, built the 99th Street Elementary School on the property. So shortly thereafter, in the 1970s, there were 800 private homes that were built, as well as 250 low-income apartments built around Love Canal. Um, and this is where Lois Gibbs lived. Um, and in 1976, finally got some information um, from mostly the University of Buffalo um, at that time. So they, the University of Buffalo revealed that there were toxic chemical residues in the air um, in the high percentage of the homes, and especially towards the south end of the canal. The drums were, were found just beneath the surface or at the surface um, in areas, around, especially around the southern part of the canal. Um, and there were high levels of what are called PCBs in the storm sewer system. So what that means is that it, when it rained, water would rush over the land, pick up some of these PCBs, and it would go into the storm water sewers, uh, the storm sewer system, which you see right in your, if you live in a urban or suburban area, um, that there are these storm sewers that collect water. Well, the, that water was tested and was found to have high amounts of PCBs in it. So PCBs were actually not even banned until 1979. Uh, what were they used for? There were chemicals that were used basically to um, create things like floor finish, uh, so the stuff that makes the, your floor shiny, um, to put insulation in homes, um, to like coat electrical equipment. It was kind of an oily, plasticky substance, waxy substance that helped to insulate things. It has no taste or smell. And at the time, it was not known, but they cause cancer, uh, both in animals as well as humans, not that humans aren't animals. Um, and the PCBs can impact your immune system, your reproductive system in the case of Lois Gibbs, your nervous system, and your endocrine system. And that's what was in the water that these kids were playing in when they were playing in the yard. Um, and that is the water that the residents were ingesting. So the lo this is sort of important in the history of, of the grassroots movement in the United States because the Love Canal Homeowners Association started collecting health data from families and that showed clusters of diseases in neighborhoods. This is the first time in U.S. history that it's been well documented that people, not scientists, but people collected their own scientific data and um, felt empowered to... Um, I guess, speak truth to power here and ask for change. 
In 1978, the New York State Department of Health finally listened. They found high levels of contaminants and recommended the 99th Street School be closed, that pregnant women and children under the age of two be evacuated, and that residents not eat out of the, their home gardens. So this is something I don't think we think about enough, is that when you are growing a home garden, that any contaminants that are in your soil are going to be taken up, in some, a lot of them will be taken up if they're soluble by groundwater, by the roots of your plants, and end up in your fruit or your vegetables. Um, and it was also recommended that people spend minimal time in their basements, and we'll talk about why when you start to answer some questions. In 1980, Jimmy, President Jimmy Carter ordered the evacuation of Love Canal and ordered it to be declared a federal emergency site. So the other important thing that happened as a direct result of this Love Canal catastrophe is there was a uh, legislation passed, the Comprehensive Environmental Response Compensation and Liability Act of 1980, um, which is known as CERCLA, but more commonly, and it's known as Superfund. So Superfund, there's Superfund sites all over, certainly Monroe County in New York State and the eastern, the eastern seaboard of the United States, um, but there are Superfund sites everywhere. They are places in the United States that have been designated so contaminated that no one can live there until they have been cleaned up. And they're typically cleaned up by the Environmental Protection Agency or the EPA. They manage the cleanup of contaminated sites and then pass the bill along to the companies for the cost of that cleanup. Um, and that can be tricky. You can see in this very um, straightforward case that there were a variety of people who contributed to the contamination. So figuring out what was the source of contamination um, because not everyone was just dumping PCBs in, in Love Canal. Um, how did it get to the people who um, were impacted? And how do you show that pretty conclusively? So there's a lot of detective work that has to go on here. It's actually really cool. So it didn't really help so much the residents of Love Canal, however. They had catastrophic health issues um, for years and ultimately, most of the homes were demolished, um, but not all of them. And But again, one of the reasons it's so significant in the history of environmental justice in our country is that it represents the beginning of community members taking the initiative to make their own scientific observation and trust their own homegrown knowledge to be able to make change. And they did at a federal level. So today, Love Canal is partially abandoned, but partially redeveloped. So the EPA did go in and what they did was they emptied out the canal um, and they put about 18 inches of clay around the canal and you'll learn why in just a bit. And then they put a plastic liner and then they actually just encapsulated all of the um, all of the waste in the area. And there's a 70 acre fenced off site where there's a wastewater collection system at the center. Um, and the water that is collected is treated through a series of carbon filters and then it's actually reused um, and so you can see there's areas that are fenced off but there's also a whole community that has been redeveloped around love canal and they live right next to this fenced off area and it's called the black creek it's called black creek village and it's just a subdivision in niagara falls where residents know what they signed up for the love canal had already happened when they bought their homes their homes are deeply discounted because of their proximity to love canal and um, i've read several articles where people will say you know what i know what's in my backyard at least and i know that there's monitoring that goes on all the time and how many people don't know what's going on in their backyard um, which is an interesting point so what you're going to do is look at some Google Earth images of Love Canal in the past and in then today and learn a little bit about why Love Canal happened. Um, not only just because obviously the toxic waste, but why didn't the barrels just sink deeper? Why didn't the contamination sink deeper? And it really has to do with the geology of the area. So that's your next challenge.